Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by. And welcome to FactSet's third fiscal quarter 2022 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are on a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press the start and the one key on your touchtone telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you recall operators, at any time, you may press start and zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker host, Kendra Brown, Head of Investor Relations. Thank you, and good morning, everyone. Welcome to FactSet's third fiscal quarter 2022 earnings call. Before we begin, I would like to point out that the slides we will reference during this presentation can be accessed via the webcast on the Investor Relations section of our website at factset.com. The slides will be posted on our website at the conclusion of this call. A replay of today's call will be available via phone and on our website. After our prepared remarks, we will open the call to questions from investors. To be fair to everyone, please limit yourself to one question plus one follow-up. Before we discuss our results, I encourage all listeners to review the legal notice on slide two, which explains the risk of forward-looking statements and the use of non-GAAP financial measures. Additionally, please refer to our forms 10-K and 10-Q for a discussion of risk factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from these forward-looking statements. Our slide presentation and discussions on this call will include certain non-GAAP financial measures. For such measures, reconciliation to the most directly comparable GAAP measures are in the appendix to the presentation and in our earnings release issued earlier today. Joining me today are Phil Snow, Chief Executive Officer, and Linda Huber, Chief Financial Officer. I will now turn the discussion over to Phil Snow. Thank you, Kendra, and hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm pleased to share our strong third quarter results as we delivered another exceptional quarter with double-digit ASV growth. As we enter our fiscal fourth quarter of 2022, we are building on our momentum and are well-positioned for the year-end. Given this outlook, we are guiding to the high end of our previously discussed financial ranges, except for the tax rate, which will be at the low end of the range. Linda will speak more about this in a moment. Our organic ASV plus professional services growth accelerated to 10% in the third quarter with strength across all workflow solutions and regions. Growth was primarily driven by analytics with success globally from asset managers and asset owners, as well as large partnership wins and increased demand from wealth management firms. Our sales and client-facing teams continue to outperform, increasing the pace of our top-line progress. We saw acceleration in year-over-year -year growth from all client types, reflecting our success in building the leading open content and analytics platform. We once again saw the continuation of double-digit growth in banking, wealth, hedge funds, corporate clients, partners, and private equity and venture capital funds. Stronger retention and accelerated expansion drove demand for our content and digital solutions for existing clients. And for new business, growth was driven by our workstation with solid performance in the Americas and EMEA and continued small and medium wins across all regions. Adjusted EPS increased 38% from the prior year period given our ASV growth and disciplined expense management. Our third quarter adjusted operating margin also expanded 500 basis points year over year to 36.6%. About two thirds of this margin expansion came from the addition of QSIP, Global Services or CGS, while the remaining one third came from our core business. Our fourth quarter pipeline continues to look strong, providing a tailwind for the remainder of fiscal 2022. Our third quarter performance is the result of intense focus on the strategic initiatives we showcased at Invest Today, scaling our content refinery, delivering next generation workflow solutions, and enhancing the client experience with an open platform and hyper-personalization. These key differentiators drive top line growth and enable us to capture more of the addressable market. FactSet's open platform powers the portfolio lifecycle with market leading solutions. Our portfolio analytics and trading products for the front and middle office drive broad-based growth on the buy side. 
Ongoing investment in the front office is paying dividends as the momentum and acceleration of our front office capabilities continues to grow. These multi-asset class portfolio analytics continue to see healthy client demand thanks to our differentiating buy-side attribution and risk capabilities. Our content refinery is driving growth in Content and Technology Solutions, or CTS, our off-platform business. As you may recall from Investor Day, this business delivers proprietary and third-party content to clients in several ways, including data feeds, APIs, or increasingly the cloud. FactSet's suite of off-platform solutions offers our clients the flexibility to decide where and how they will consume their data. And our ability to concord or connect data is a real differentiator. As clients increasingly want to consume data programmatically, we're expanding our robust suite of data management and workflow solutions. QSIP Global Services, a CTS business component, is a great example of this expansion. I'm pleased with the performance of the CGS team. Its integration with FactSet has gone very well. Together, our teams are working to expand the business, focusing on private companies, ESG, digital assets, and issuance trends, uh, these opportunities are promising, but several will take time, so it's still early days. Linda will discuss CGS's performance in more detail later in the call. In the current volatile market, our investments in content and workflow solutions put us in a resilient position. Our clients clearly recognize the value of our diverse product portfolio, and we are committed to increasing the pace of these investments for the next few years. We will continue to invest in our content refinery, building on our offerings in ESG, deep sector, real-time, private markets, and wealth. And as we discussed at Invest today, our investments drive client demand and will be a driver of growth in the years to come. Looking across our regions, we saw broad-based acceleration across all our markets. The Americas continues to be the biggest contributor to growth, with organic ASV growth accelerating to 10.1%. This was driven by research and advisory, with the workstation driving new business, especially among corporates. Expansion was driven largely by wins at wealth clients. In EMEA, ASV growth accelerated to 8.3%. Workstation sales drove growth with asset managers and banks. We saw increased ASV capture in the region due to the international price increase, better price realization, and workstation expansion. New business also contributed to growth, driven by increased workstation sales within wealth firms. Asia-Pacific's performance remains strong, with ASV growth at 14.3%, driven by demand from asset managers and asset owners. We saw a higher retention and expansion among existing clients across many countries. Both CTS and analytics contributed to growth with higher expansion with asset owners and asset managers, respectively. In summary, I'm very pleased with our third quarter performance. We continue to invest in our business and platform, which is paying off, giving us good momentum as we head into the fourth quarter. Looking ahead, we are confident in our strategy and ability to navigate volatile markets. We remain committed to the medium-term outlook we shared at Invest today of 8 to 9% ASV growth, 11 to 13% EPS growth, and 35 to 36% adjusted operating margin. FactSet has a proven history of growth in volatile markets. Our subscription-based model provides stability and fosters client retention. We're prepared for potential downturn scenarios with specific levers to reduce our spending if necessary, even as we continue to invest in our business, which Linda will discuss in more detail. Ultimately, our open platform, content refinery, and personalized workflow solutions will continue to set us apart. Underpinning all our efforts is our incredible team. Our culture is a key differentiator in this competitive environment and we're committed to attracting, retaining, and developing top talent. Like many of you, our leadership team has increased our in-person interactions. It's been great to meet with clients again, have visitors in our offices, and engage with fact setters face-to-face. We provide flexibility for our employees with our hybrid work model, which has been very well received, and I'm proud of the work our team does every day to deliver on our goals and constantly improve our products. I will now turn it over to Linda to take you through the specifics of our Q3 performance. Thank you, Phil, and hello to everyone on the call. As you've seen from our press release this morning, we are pleased to report continued acceleration in our top line with double-digit growth year-over-year in revenues, organic ASV, 
and adjusted diluted EPS. I'll now share some more details on our third quarter performance. Consistent with our definition of organic revenues and ASV, we will exclude any revenue in ASV associated with CGS when reporting organic-related metrics for the 12 months following the acquisition date. We will, however, provide some specifics on CGS so you can track its initial performance as part of FactSet. As Kendra previously noted, a reconciliation of our adjusted metrics to comparable gap figures is included at the end of our press release. We grew third quarter organic ASV plus professional services at 10% year over year. This acceleration reflects disciplined execution of our sales pipeline and pricing plans. In addition, investments in content and workstation functionality continue to support both retention and better price realization. For example, our third quarter international price increase contributed $10 million in ASV, an increase of $3 million, or 30%, from last year. Third quarter gap revenue increased by 22% from the prior year period to $489 million. Organic revenue, which excludes any impact from foreign exchange, acquisitions during the last 12 months, and deferred revenue amortization, increased 10% to $442 million over the prior year period. Growth was driven by our research and advisory and analytics solutions, as well as by the acquisition of QCIP Global Services. All regions saw robust growth, benefiting from acceleration in all three workflow solutions. For our geographic segments, organic revenue growth over the prior year period for the Americas was 7%, EMEA at 13%, and Asia-Pacific at 24%. Turning now to expenses, GAAP operating expenses grew 39% year-over-year to $392 million, impacted by several charges incurred during the period. First, as previously discussed, we have been resizing our real estate footprint to match our hybrid work model. This quarter, we recognize $49 million in impairment charges. While we will continue to evaluate our real estate needs, this initiative is largely complete. We do not anticipate similarly sized real estate impairment charges in the quarters to come. Also in the third quarter, we incurred $12 million in one-time acquisition costs related to the CGS acquisition. In addition, we recognized $13 million in acquisition-related intangible asset amortization during the quarter. Going forward, this intangible asset amortization will be a recurring charge. Given these charges, our GAAP operating margin decreased by 956 basis points to 19.9% compared to the prior period. Adjusted operating margin increased by 500 basis points to 36.6% compared to the prior year, exceeding our guidance on this measure, driven by lower compensation expenses, lower tech and content costs, and lower facilities expenses. As a percentage of revenue, our cost of sales was 582 basis points lower than last year on a gap basis and 792 basis points lower on an adjusted basis. This decrease was primarily due to lower employee compensation and lower technology and content related expenses, including our ongoing shift to the public cloud. When expressed as a percentage of revenue, SG&A was 536 basis points higher year over year on a gap basis and 292 basis points higher on an adjusted basis. The primary drivers of the increase include CGS acquisition costs, increased employee compensation expense, and higher bonus accrual. Moving on to tax, our tax rate for the quarter was 12.2% compared to last year's rate of 11.9%. This was primarily due to lower projected levels of income before income taxes, and a tax provision reduction related to the lower rate compared with the three months ended May 31, 2021. GAAP EPS decreased 26% to $1.93 this quarter versus $2.62 in the prior year, primarily due to real estate impairment charges, acquisition expenses, and higher interest expenses, partially offset by higher revenues. Adjusted diluted EPS grew 38.2% from the prior year to $3.76, largely driven by revenue growth, margin expansion, and a lower tax rate. Adjusted EBITDA increased to $173 million, up 30% year over year. And finally, free cash flow, which we define as cash generated from operations less capital spending, was $177 million for the quarter, an increase of 45% over the same period last year. A key driver for our increased cash flow is the acquisition of CGS, 
which has performed well since closing on March 1st. Speaking of the CGS acquisition, we are now 100 days in, and CGS is tracking ahead of plan on all fronts. Its financial performance was robust in Q3, with both sales and margins exceeding expectations. As we discussed on our second quarter earnings call, we're on track to realize $5 million in ASV in fiscal 2022 from CGS. It is a resilient business with steady top line and good cash flow, even in a potential market downturn. While CGS's issuance fees are more sensitive to market activity, these fees make up only 15% of CGS's revenue. Functional integration of the CGS operation is well along, and we now expect to exit our transition services agreement ahead of schedule. Our ASV retention for the third quarter remained greater than 95%. We grew the total number of clients by 19% compared to the prior year, driven by the addition of more corporate and wealth clients. User count increased by more than 2,000 since last quarter, thanks to an increase in research and advisory users. Year-over-year, user count grew by 12%. Our client retention remains at 92% year-over-year, reflecting the strength of our subscription revenue model. Turning now to our balance sheet, on March 1st, we issued our inaugural investment-grade senior notes. These notes comprised $500 million of 2.9% five-year senior notes and $500 million of 3.45 10-year senior notes. At the same time, we entered into a new credit agreement updating our term and revolving credit facilities. We're pleased that our fixed-rate senior notes are well-priced given recently increasing interest rates. In addition, as you may recall, we've hedged 80% of our total debt from floating rate exposure for 24 months, largely protecting, protecting us against rising interest rates. And as we have said before, we're proud of our investment grade ratings. In the third quarter, we made a planned prepayment of $125 million on our term loan, bringing our gross leverage ratio down to 3.5 times from the initial 3.9 times level when we acquired CGS. We expect to make three more payments of $125 million in each of the next three quarters, enabling us to reach our gross leverage target of two to two and a half times in the second half of fiscal 2023. During this time, while we may continue minor share repurchases to offset the dilutive impact of stock option grants, we do not intend to resume our share repurchase program until at least mid-2023. Lastly, we'd like to remind investors that we increased our regular quarterly dividend in the third quarter for the 23rd consecutive year of dividend increases. The increase was 8.5% for a per share dividend of 89 cents. Next, I'd like to discuss planning for our downturn playbook scenario. First off, it's important to note that FactSet remains committed to top-line growth supported by our investment plans. We would expect to maintain these investment plans even under a downside scenario. As Phil mentioned, historically, FactSet has fared well in volatile markets as our subscription business model provides stability, even in challenging times. With more than 40 years of consecutive revenue growth, we've successfully navigated several down cycles. We significantly outperformed the S&P 500 on revenue, operating income, and EPS in 2007, 2008, and 2009. In fact, in 2008 and 2009, FactSet EPS was positive, while S&P 500 EPS was double-digit negative. That said, it's sound financial practice to be prepared for all scenarios. As part of this planning, we've identified 2 to 3% of our $1.2 billion in operating expenses, or 24 to $36 million, that we could potentially reduce to maintain margins in the event of a severe downturn. First, if we experience lower ASV, our bonus pool would adjust accordingly per our pre-established performance targets, providing the largest share of expense reductions. Lower ASV would also proportionately reduce variable third-party data and content costs. Lastly, we could potentially reduce T&E expenses through virtual engagement. This is a planning exercise we will undertake quarterly in order to rebalance resources given prevailing market conditions. To confirm, this exercise is just scenario planning. As we look to end our fiscal year on August 31st, FactSet is on track for a strong finish. Given our performance this quarter and robust pipeline, we reaffirm our previously communicated guidance for fiscal 2022. 
We expect growth at the upper end of the previously provided ranges for most of the metrics in our annual outlook. The exception would be the effective tax rate, which is expected to fall at the lower end of the previously communicated range. As a reminder, CGS is not included in our, our organic ASV guidance. However, as we discussed earlier in the call, we expect CGS to contribute approximately $5 million in ASV in fiscal 2022. All in all, we are encouraged by the demand for our content and workflow solutions. Our investments continue to drive growth in our digital platform. Our sales team continues to provide excellent execution, and we're continuing to improve our price realization. Although there is uncertainty in the macro environment, we believe our diverse product portfolio and stable financial position will serve us well for the longer term. With that, we're now ready to take your questions. Operator? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question at this time, you will need to press the start and the one key on your touchtone telephone. And as a reminder, to be fair to everyone, please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. Now, first question coming from the line of Manav Patnaik with Barclays. Your line is open. Yeah, thank you. Good morning. Um, my, my first question is just around, you know, the guidance. I mean, given the current quarter numbers and the momentum thus far, it sounds like you should – you know, be able to very comfortably, uh, you know, touch the high end or even beat the guidance. So just curious as to, you know, why perhaps you didn't, uh, you know, change or raise uh, those numbers. Are you starting to see any feedback from your clients, perhaps, just given the macro slowdowns, if that's flowing through to them or not? Just was looking for some commentary there. Hey, Manav, thanks for the question. It's Phil. So uh, I'll kick off here, and I'm sure Linda will have a few additional comments. So, yeah, in terms of the fourth quarter pipeline, um, you know, we're definitely confident in the range that, um, you know, we, we guided to in the last quarter uh, and the high end of that range. So it's a very high-quality pipeline, I would say, in terms of um, what's in there. You know, we're seeing very good strength on the buy side, uh, and analytics has had um, a very good few quarters in a row here. So we're seeing good strength and visibility on the buy side. Uh, with banking, obviously, there was a very good um, uplift last year from sell-side hiring. We, we're anticipating good sell-side hiring, uh, maybe not as high as last year, but certainly, I think, more positive versus previous years. So in terms of the top line, uh, that's what we see going out, at least today. Um, and I'm, I'll, I'll allow Linda here to kind of get into a little bit more of the, uh, the, other, the other pieces of guidance. So. Yeah. Hi, Manav. Um, we feel really good about where we are. The swing factor here is really the tax rate as we go into the fourth quarter. Uh, we've got a couple of discrete items uh, that may swing either way. So, uh, in fact, we may end up doing better as we get through the end of the fourth quarter. But um, given the market conditions right now and, and the way the market is bouncing around, uh, I think it's prudent uh, to be confident but not cocky. And so uh, we thought that this was, was the best way to go. But uh, thank you for pointing that out. Got it. And, and just, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, pipeline, like maybe more on the product side, uh, you know, I think last recession, like you pointed out, you guys grew through it, but I think you were, you know, a smaller company, you know, a lot more share, et cetera, to be had. Can you just talk about, you know, the, the product pipeline and how that might help you do the same thing in the event we do go through a slowdown? Sure, yeah, happy to do that. And, um, yeah, I mean, we've lived through these, and many of our sales leaders and specialty sales leaders have, 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 have been through these types of cycles, so we're very experienced here. And the really good news is we have more product and ways to help clients than ever before. Uh, so it's um, a very good story to go into a client and really talk to them about, you know, what it is they're facing and what problems we can solve for them. And, um, you know, sometimes it's to our benefit because it really brings people to the table sometimes a little bit sooner than they might have traditionally done that. So, you know, I would probably put this into three camp or three categories, Manav. The first is the portfolio life cycle for the buy side is really getting some good traction here. Uh, the analytics team has had significant acceleration over the last year, and we're seeing strength come through uh, in risk. Um, our quant products, so our, you know, we now have programmatic access to the platform, and that's been very well received. Uh, and our trading products have done very well as well. And when there's increased volatility in the markets, that's certainly helpful. And that's just 
bolstered by like the excellent performance of the performance and reporting parts of that business. So analytics is firing on all cylinders. Uh, and because we're a more open platform now when we plug in in more places, it really just puts us in a great position on the buy side. Um, and I think that open um, theme is important as well. So not just for the buy side, but for all kinds of clients, we're finding ways that we can integrate with CRMs, for example, and other pieces of our clients' workflow. So I recently had a bunch of visits with uh, with clients, and it feels a little different, frankly, than two years ago. They're really understanding our story now and seeing the differentiators that we bring to the table. And it's very exciting to be in those conversations with, you know, with CTOs and CIOs uh, at some of our largest clients. And then just the workstation, you know, I think we've got a kind of a renaissance in the workstation. That's how I like to think about it. Uh, we really have good momentum here, and we're growing our business across a lot of different firm types. So it's very broad-based. And lastly, you know, the investments that we've made in content are really paying off. Deep sector has already paid off, but we're, getting, we're beginning to see private markets and ESG come through, and we're also investing in real time. So there's so many weapons that we have now for our salespeople to go out there and help our clients. And what I'm encouraged by, it's across every business line we have, and it's across every region, and it's across every firm type. So, you know, we're very well uh, distributed here in terms of our opportunity. I think better prepared than ever for any sort of downturn in the market. Got it. Thank you very much, Phil. Sure. You're welcome. And our next question coming from the line of Tony Kaplan with Morgan Stanley. Yelena Sulpin. Thanks so much. Um, just continuing on the downturn theme, um, hoping you could remind us how professional services acts during downturns. And now you have the non-subscription part of uh, QSIP. It's you know, under 15% of that business. Could you just remind us what, what's in there and, and how discretionary, I guess, that is? Um, that's my first question. Thank you. Um, sure, Tony. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a small piece of fact set, and most of the professional services that we offer um, are really to implement our analytics suite, which, as I just mentioned, is having very good momentum here. So, you know, we didn't really have a big professional services uh, team during the last downturn, which, you know, was, I think, a little over 10 years ago. Um, but I anticipate that, you know, we're, we'll have the people we need to implement these products, uh, and I wouldn't imagine that that's a headwind for us at all. Linda, I don't know if you've got any additional. Yeah, uh, to follow up on your question on QSIP, Tony, um, the 15% of revenues that comes from the assignment of new QSIP numbers for new securities, you're correct about that. That is not recurring revenue. The other 85% of QSIP revenues um, are, in fact, recurring. So if we do have a bit of a slowdown in capital markets activity, we may see a slight uh, trending down of that 15% of QSIP's revenues, but I'm not sure that you're going to notice that overall in the total mix of the company, and um, we would expect that that would um, – just be if capital markets um, do take a downturn. So, again, that piece is pretty minor as well. Yeah, makes sense. I um, wanted to ask on the expense side. So, Linda, you mentioned the real estate uh, opportunities are sort of largely done. Uh, I know you were looking into third-party data costs for savings as well. Um, is that ahead of us or is that complete and just, Overall, how how should we think about normalized operating margins just post the real estate savings, headcount savings, all of that? Thanks. Sure. Um, on real estate, you're correct, Tony. We're we're pretty much through this. Um, we've reduced our real estate footprint overall by something close to 40 percent, which works really well with our hybrid model. Uh, we had said at Investor Day, savings that come off of that are going to take some time to materialize. Uh, as we have to still consider um, the leases that uh, that we we have, so we're looking at 10 to 14 million dollars of reinvestable funds over three years. So perhaps not quite as much as you would think. Um, on the margin front, we're incredibly happy with the margin progress that we've made. 500 basis points is a lot. Two thirds of that comes from QSIP, the other third from the base business. So it's important to note the base business. business is doing well also. Um, 
on the second bucket of um, personnel costs, um, we noticed that we came out about where we had expected this quarter. Salaries are a little bit lighter because it has been challenging to fill all of the open positions that we have, but our bonus accrual is higher because we've done well. So we did $31 million of bonus accrual in the third quarter. Um, in the first and second quarter, we were at about 21 and $22 million. So we're running $75 million through three quarters, and you should expect that the fourth quarter would probably be an average of those three, so 25, 26 million. So we're looking at what we expect to be potentially even a hundred million dollar bonus pool this year. Um, so that is heftier than uh, than what we've done in previous years. So bonus pool upside kind of offset the uh, salary line uh, running a little bit light. On third-party data costs, this is a tricky one. Uh, we are in inflationary times. Um, we've worked quite hard on this, and we will continue with our procurement group to negotiate effectively. Uh, I think we would see this line moving up sort of 3-ish percent, maybe a little bit more. This one we're going to have to watch, and we'll have more information for you. Uh, but we, we have um, looked to beef up the procurement activity to make sure that we've got that right. And technologies come in about where we had expected. We expect technology costs will move up, though, as we said Great success with the cloud with our clients, which has um, resulted in greater costs for greater utilization. And we're building more of our own software, so amortization continues to, to move up as a trend. But um, basically, you know, we've, we've handled the um, acquisition expenses for QSIP. Those have come through. And um, the trends are looking, looking pretty good. Uh, you had seen the margin guidance over the, the longer term, the margin goals, uh, of 35 to 36 percent adjusted, and uh, we feel like we're making very good progress on that. So, hope that is a fulsome answer to all your questions, Tony. Thanks for all the color. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And our next question coming from the line of Achisa Badra with RBC Capital Markets. Yolanda Sopin. Uh, thanks for taking my question. So, my first question wanted to focus on the comment around that large partnership. Uh, when that was highlighted up front, uh, Phil, uh, as well as uh, the expansion uh, and wins at wealth clients. I was wondering if you could provide further color on those, both of those, just the pipeline for further partnership as well as uh, pipeline for wealth management. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks, Ashish. Uh, yeah, we have a very strong partnerships business, and as our platform has become more open and we uh, have more to offer from our content refinery, it gives us a good opportunity to uh, – to distribute, you know, what we have on the shelves through different ways. So we, we did have a very nice deal in Europe um, that was driven by a lot of our core content. So that was a big contributor to Europe's growth and CTS's growth uh, this quarter. And on the wealth side, it's a very well distributed. So I think quarter after a quarter, you see the new logos and the um, increase in our workstations. Uh, you know, wealth's usually on the leaderboard there, if not at the top of it. Uh, and there's just a steady pipeline of larger deals, you know, that we're just systematically knocking our way through. So it's hard to sort of scrape a ton of these over in any given year, just how long those contracts are and how big a decision it is for some of those firms. Uh, but I have every confidence in the world in our wealth team. They're doing exceptionally well. Uh, we're really killing it within, you know, the space that we're, uh, focused on, and we do think there's a greater opportunity uh, in wealth uh, to capture more of, um, you know, the wealth advisor's workflow as we look forward. That's great color. And, Linda, uh, thanks for providing that detailed uh, color around incentive comps and uh, details around real estate saving. But uh, just wanted to drill down further on the guidance piece. If I look at the implied fourth quarter guidance, uh, that implies a significant moderation of uh, margins uh, in the fourth quarter. And so I was wondering, is there any particular puts and takes that we need to be cognizant of uh, for the fourth quarter, or is that just, as you mentioned earlier, uh, just conservatism baked into given the economic environment? Well, I think it would be fair to say, Ashish, that we, we are being uh, conservative given the economic environment. That That is fair. A um, couple of things to think about. If we are able to hire more heavily in the fourth quarter, um, you may see some increase in the salary line. Uh, that would be something to keep an eye on. And again, 
The accrual will be a bit higher in the fourth quarter uh, for the bonus pool, which is an important thing as well, given that the company is performing really well. Uh, the guidance, again, turns on what happens with the tax line. And again, we've got a couple of discrete items that we're keeping an eye on. And it is possible that we may uh, find ourselves with higher EPS, but we're going to, going to have to watch that and we're going to have to see. So hope that is helpful to you. That's great, Kalilinda, and thanks uh, for that. Uh, uh, and congrats on such a strong result. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question coming from the line of Alex Graham with UBS. Your line is open. Yes, hey, hello, everyone. Just uh, just want to come back to the uh, the pipeline comments that you made earlier and, and, and I guess, the unchanged guide for ASV. Um, so, you know, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, Yes, maybe the sell side is a little bit softer, but but obviously you're still pointing towards a pretty big step down year over year in the fourth quarter. So my question here is, is there something about seasonality that has changed? I think I've had some discussions with you guys that, that maybe uh, you changed the Well, I think you've changed some of the sales incentive structure a little bit. So just wondering if, if that has perhaps pulled forward some sales into earlier quarters, and then you're actually trying to smooth out the uh, the seasonality a little bit. So maybe you can just talk about this a little bit, not uh, so we're not surprised that maybe the the quarters are just a little bit different than they were historically. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, so I think there is something to um, the second part of your question there. So I did, you know, I've had conversations with Helen. I think you know Helen and Linda have really teamed up to make sure that we have incentives there for the salespeople. Uh, earlier in the year, and obviously, if we can get the ASV in early, it means good things, right, for uh, for for all the other financial metrics. So we're certainly trying to do that and not have all our chips, you know, on on the river, basically, on the last quarter of the of, of the year. Uh, and you know, this is going to be a strong fourth quarter for us, particularly, I think, if you compare it to uh, years prior to last year. We did get a very strong uplift. Uh, in Q4 towards, you know, within the last month of, uh, of, of of last year. And it's a little hard to predict whether or not that's going to happen again. And a lot of that did come from banking. So we see strength in banking, uh, but it's hard to say that we're going to get the same effect that we had uh, last year. So that's how I would uh, characterize um, both, both parts of your question. There. Great. Thank you. And then second quick one here. Um, this may be a little bit in the weeds, but uh, one of your large competitors, Bloomberg, to name them, um, I think there's a change uh, happening on July 1st um, that is creating a little bit of uh, movement. Uh, I, I guess if I'm if I'm characterizing this correctly, I think there's some changes to how how uh, people can reuse Bloomberg remotely, which I think during COVID they they were very helpful, and now they're turning this off. And I, I, from what I understand, a lot of the sell side in particular is scrambling to find alternatives to those people who are no longer going to be able to, to get to those shared terminals. So it just sounds to me like that uh, fact that in particular has been front and center on this and trying to help uh, a lot of the sales side with that and, and that those could actually be some meaningful new users that, that maybe you didn't have an opportunity to, to, to get before. So, again, I know it's a little bit in the weeds, but but just wondering if, if you've seen that, if this could actually be a meaningful um, new kind of competitive win here that we're seeing in the fourth quarter and, and, and how meaningful that could be. Thank you. Well, we always want to be helpful for our clients. That's uh, certainly the case. So I, I wouldn't expect any, I think, big tailwind from that this quarter, but obviously we're we're focused on the competitive environment and, uh, you know, sometimes it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, sort of one desk at a time, but we do feel that all the investment we're making, particularly in our workstation now for front office professionals, uh, is become, becoming differentiating. So I'm very optimistic about our long-term prospects there, Alex. All right. Fair enough. I guess I'll wait for another quarter to see what happens. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, our next question coming from the line of Hamza Mansari with Jeffrey. The line is open. Hey, hey, good morning. Thank you. Uh, my first question is just if you could maybe update us on what pricing is trending. I, I think you had said 3 to 4%, uh, but realization may, may have been lower. I think that was last quarter. But any changes to the pricing model uh, that, that you're thinking of in this environment? I know historically you've 
talked a little bit about simplifying it, and you've also referenced sort of value-based pricing. Uh, so just any thoughts on pricing would be helpful. Yeah, thanks, Hamza. A couple of things. So, yeah, we did um, set out to, you know, capture an additional 100 basis points of price pricing this year, and I think we were very successful at that. In addition, you know, all the work that Helen has done with the product teams to simplify our packages is resulting in us capturing a lot more value uh, through the, th you know, through through that effort. So both of those things have been very positive this year. And, uh, you know, clearly we're in an inflationary environment, so we're thinking carefully about the right balance, you know, for our clients next year. But we do believe, you know, facts that is a sticky tool, and we've invested a ton in the product where, you know, it's a, it, it, there's a lot more value in there than there was even two years ago. So we do feel like we've got good pricing power uh, going into this environment. Yeah, Hamza, yeah. It's Linda. Um, so 4% um, across the, the platform, and uh, we have just dealt with our international price increases, as you know. Uh, we've kept those consistent internationally and in the U.S. Um, internationally, you know, we saw $10 million in ASV uplift, uh, $3 million of that uh, year-over-year increase, at, or 30%. So price realization has been extremely important for facts that, um, as Phil had said, discipline's improving. Uh, our pricing desk has been very helpful to make sure that uh, we don't overly modify various packages that we're showing to clients, and um, we're really pleased with this effort. We'll have to see what inflation looks like for next year, and um, we do feel that the value of the products is allowing us to provide that value-based pricing to clients, but pricing discipline has really been very helpful to us and, and a real tailwind. Great. That's very helpful. Thank you. And just my follow-up, I'll, I'll turn it over, um, is, is really around, um, you know, I know you talked about the downturn playbook and gave good detail on sort of the cost opportunity, but just looking at it from a, from a revenue standpoint, uh, you know, the, I guess maybe just frame for us, uh, has your visibility uh, become better uh, in the portfolio as you've m moved sort of more to a workflow business relative to, you know, historically? Uh, has there been any change in, you know, your subscription contracts around cancellation clauses or anything just visibility-wise that uh, whether you have more or less visibility versus history? And I think you referenced uh, – you know, some of your customer conversations. Maybe you can just remind us what, what some of those conversations have been, what you're hearing from customers, just in terms of the environment. Thank you. Sure. Um, well, I will say, you know, the, the pipeline is, is is very high quality, and we have more and more discipline, I think, in terms of uh, how we do that consistently globally. So, um, But I'm not sure that we can ever, at least for now, look out more than six months, right, uh, um, with, with any huge degree of confidence. So that's sort of been consistent in terms of my messaging is, you know, usually a couple of quarters out, uh, we can predict with a, with a high degree of certainty. Uh, we do have a, a large percentage of our clients, though, under multi-year, or ASV under multi-year contracts. Uh, so that, that does provide us, obviously, some visibility there for those clients that are uh, not in the last year of their contract. Got it. Thank you. Sure. <clears throat> now, our next question coming from the line of Andrew Nicholas with Will and Blair. Your line is open. Thank you, and, and good morning. Um, the first question I wanted to ask was just kind of on, on upside to, to your own internal expectations. Um, obviously, you've, you've raised guidance already this year. Now you're looking to the top end. It looks like there could be some conservatism in that, in that number. I'm just curious what has surprised you positively, what is, has more momentum than you had expected in any other color on, on exactly what is driving that? Well, I'm not too surprised. I think we've got a very good team here. We've had a consistent strategy over the last three years. It's just really nice to see it all come through and come through in so many different places. Um, and I'm very encouraged by our workstation growth. I think that, I think there were a lot of questions probably you know, within the analyst community about whether or not we could continue to capture more desks and, and overcome uh, the trend from, uh, you know, from active to passive. Uh, so it's just, it's just very encouraging and rewarding for the whole team to see the results. Um, 
so I think that's how I would answer that. We're, you know, we're confident. Uh, we've got a, we've got an engine now that's firing on all cylinders and a lot more coming through. So I think we're, we're going into this environment with a lot of confidence and, and our ability to execute. And Andrew, I think we would also say the addition of the QSIP business is very helpful to us. Um, it's come in uh, a bit stronger than we had even expected. Uh, you have to keep in mind that this was um, a little bit of a, a challenging thing to, to bring on board. We moved through the acquisition process and looking at QSIP in sort of an eight-week period. It was a very quick sale process, and the seller did not um, account for QSIP as a separate entities. There were a lot of um, accounting allocation things and so on that we weren't exactly sure how all of this would lay out. But as we've brought it over, the integration has gone really, really well, and um, it has performed even a bit better than we had expected, as we noted. So very pleased about that. Uh, its margin addition is helpful to us. It allows us to continue a robust investment program and get some other things done. So we're very pleased with that acquisition, which was financed in an attractive way at a great time. So uh, all of that is working together now, and um, we're just very happy with how we're firing on all cylinders. Great. Thank you. That, that's all helpful. And then maybe for my follow-up, maybe just a bigger picture question. Uh, a lot of talk now about kind of a downturn playbook, how the business would perform. How, how would you expect the competitive marketplace to change in any more challenging time for the end market? Do you do you think that the share gains that you've seen over the past, you know, several years are, are easier to continue uh, getting, or, or is it more difficult, or just kind of any thoughts on how a more challenging backdrop economically and, and for asset managers and your clients might might impact your ability to win business relative to to others in the space? Thank you. Yeah, so, you know, I, I'll start on the buy side. So, you know, if, if their assets are down and their revenues are down, of course they're going to be looking closely at their budgets. But, again, it's a good it's a good opportunity to uh, proactively talk to them, uh, re-educate them about everything we have, bring them to the table. And there is this ongoing trend, which um, has been going on now for a while, where the, the larger – uh, buy side firms in particular are really looking to consolidate and cut in half the number of content and technology providers they work with. And there's really a very limited number of firms like Fax that they can go in and offer uh, so much across their workflow. So for us, we welcome this. You know, I think it's a great opportunity for us. And we have a long history of working with clients that really trust us and want to partner with us. So um, you know, we'll go through these cycles. We've been through them before, and I anticipate we'll do very well on a relative basis like we have historically. Yeah, Andrew, we are very focused on what we're able to do uh, for productivity for our clients. And anecdotally, we've heard some of them say that uh, moving to FactSet has provided 20% greater productivity. We're sharpening up our, our marketing pitch on that just to make sure that uh, we've got that right and we can bring that to the fore for existing clients and potential clients. But, um, you know, the, the ease of use of our products and uh, the elimination of the need to flip back and forth between screens and so on uh, is really a, a very big help, and we feel, you know, a very up-to-date way to conduct business and to handle the workflows. So productivity is, is really important, and we think we can really be a big driver of that for our clients. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. And our next question coming from the line of Craig Huber with Huber Research Partners. Yolanda Selpin. Yes, hi. Thank you. I want to focus on the the uh, corporate part of your business, the, the sell through there and how you're doing. It seems like it's doing quite well. Maybe you could touch on that. Maybe you could tell us what the, the growth rates are there. And I'm always curious to hear what the percentage of overall revenue is. So why don't we start there? Sure, Craig. Yeah, we don't we don't break it out, but it is one of our fastest growing client types. And like wealth, it's typically on the leaderboard in terms of new logos. So we we have a very very strong product for investor relations. We also do very well with you know the M and A or business development groups at our clients. And the, all of the new investments we're making in content around deep sector, private markets, all of this opens up uh, new. Uh, clients to us and, uh, and and more workflows as well. I already mentioned that we're beginning to 
very effectively get into the CRM workflows of different types of clients. So this isn't an area that the traditionally FactSet has focused on a lot because they, they typically want big wins. But with our investments and all of the efficiency now that we have in terms of our sales um, force, um, it really allows us to do volume, I think, in, in a way that makes sense for the company. So I have a lot of, uh, you know, I, I feel very optimistic about, you know, what we can do in the corporate space and continue that to continue to be a growth driver and a more meaningful part of our business over time. And then my follow-up question, please, to talk about uh, the client retention rates. So obviously, you have a 95% retention rate or a percent of clients, 92%. It's very, very high, obviously. Um, it held up quite well, as you allude to, back in 08, 09. I'm just curious, given the macro environment, what is your sort of thought on, on, on how that might progress here in the, in the coming quarters here, given the macro environment? It's hard to predict, but we've seen very, very good trends uh, in client retention, and I give a lot of credit to Helen and the sales team in terms of how they've organized and how they've really focused on client success and, and placed a very heavy, heavy emphasis on uh, making sure that our clients are well served. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's if you can retain clients, it really is a very good foundation. So there's a ton of great work that's gone on. Um, you know, I, I think I saw in one of the analyst reports uh, a question about, how we're doing uh, reorganizing by firm type. Well, we've done that primarily in the Americas for now, but that's been a very good uh, program, um, and we've essentially now segmented the sales force in a way where they really just focus by firm type rather than by geography, and that means we understand our clients even better than we did before. Uh, so there's multiple efforts going on uh, that are going to help with, with retention. Great. Thanks a lot. Sure. Yeah. Now, our next question coming from the line of Faiza Awi with Deutsche Bank. Your line is open. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, Linda, I wanted to go back on the 4Q margin guide specifically, because uh, obviously you had a really good margin quarter at 36.6%, and your fiscal 22 guide of 34% implies, you know, a 4Q margin of around 32 and I know I was listening very carefully when you were answering prior questions, and I didn't hear anything, um, you know, specific in terms of what might impact margins in 4Q. So I just wanted to give you one more opportunity to tell us that you're being conservative. <laughs> Thank you very much, Faiza. Um, we may have, as we said, a bit higher expenditures on hiring and also on bonus. Um, we have guided for the, the full year, and keep in mind that that guidance applies to, uh, to the full year, and we've done quite well in the third quarter. So we do hope that that continues. And, um, you know, I, I think it is fair to say that we're, we're trying to be prudent here. Uh, we were pleased with what QSIP provided to us, and, um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we'll be able to come in ahead of our guidance. So we're going to have to wait and see. Um, very much appreciate your uh, appreciation of our having good good work done on the margin this quarter. We're keeping a careful eye on our costs, and um, you know as long as the the ASV continues in the trend that we're seeing, uh, we're quite hopeful. So uh, we will we will see how the year wraps up. Great, thanks. And then just to, just wanted to follow up generally on ESG and true value. I know there you have. A slightly differentiated offering as you provide more of an outside-in perspective. Um, so wanted to see if you could share some color on what type of feedback you've received from clients. Is the, you know, is the product offering where you'd like it to be, or is there more work to be done in terms of, you know, integrating the product itself um, within the fact that whether it's workstation or, you know, other APIs, and maybe how, how you see the offering evolving over time. Sure. Um, it's been about 18 months, and I'm very happy with uh, the progress we've made, Pfizer. So, yes, it is integrated into the FactSet workstation. That's one thing. We've also done a good job of integrating uh, the majority of the TBL process into the core content platform, and we're extending the coverage of ESG uh, from public markets into private markets, and that's been an undertaking that's beginning to have some real success. So, 
Our methodology is different. Uh, we think it's differentiating and, and good, and it requires some education of the clients. Uh, but we do have a very good growth rate for that business within CTS, uh, and it's a big piece of our focus as we go into the next three years in terms of where we're going to be investing and how we can really bring, I think, more clarity to this for our clients in the marketplace. And FISA, um, it's Linda, our data collection efforts have really picked up in pace, and we've been very, very pleased with how that has gone. Uh, ESG is one of the heaviest areas of investment. We've just come through our investment decisions, and um, ESG is where we're directing um, a good chunk of our, our investment pool. So lots to do there, pleased with how it's gone. Um, we've tripled sort of the uh, the run rate on ESG coming out of True Value Labs since we've um, integrated the acquisition. And uh, please watch the space. We're, we're quite excited about it. Great. Thank you. And our next question coming from the line of Slomo Rosenthal with Stiefel Yelanis Open. Hi. Thank you for taking my questions. Uh, Phil, I have just a quick question on – you know, what's going on with the equity markets and the decline um, of all these asset values? Is this impacting your ability to close deals or slowing any of the sales cycle of the sales cycle or, or anything like that? Are you seeing the clients at this point in time reacting in, in a way that we would, um, you know, would indicate that maybe things are slowing or is it really just kind of they're taking it and just kind of um, watching it but not really changing their, their MO right now? We haven't seen a lot of uh, change, Slomo. The one firm type where I would say we've seen a little bit more of a slowdown is in the hedge funds, which, as you know, is a smaller piece of our business, maybe around 5%. Uh, and that's had a pretty good growth rate over the last um, year or so, and we expect we'll still be able to grow the hedge funds. But that's really the only part, I think, where we've seen any sort of uh, real sign that the sort of delays uh, in decision-making. Um, you know, we don't want to be naive here. We think, you know, obviously clients are taking a good look at their budgets going into next year, but for all the reasons we outlined on the call already, I think we're in, we're in pole position here to make sure that we're there to help them and continue to invest and grow. Okay, thank you. And then this one, maybe for Linda, just a little it, um, kind of housekeeping thing. Was there a materially high level of ARDSO at QSIP when it was purchased? There was a commentary about in the press release about how uh, ability to make collections in both the core business and in QSIP. And if I look at the ARDSO, it's up both sequentially a, a little bit and year over year. And that kind of implies that maybe you bought a business that had a lot of outstanding receivables. I was just uh, wondering if that's something to think about. I'm just trying to think about how to model the free cash flow going forward. Yeah, Shlomo, you get um, a best student gold star because you have a correct observation. Uh, yes, accounts receivable has popped up by quite a bit. Um, the QCIP team has, has done a great job at a lot of things, but uh, we've got to sharpen their pencils there on the accounts receivable collections. Um, so uh, we're well aware of that, and uh, we will we will make sure that we get to it. But your observation is correct. That's one of the types of things when you acquire a business uh, from another firm and you're still working with a technical services agreement uh, that we've we've got to do some work on to to uh, get that number down. But uh, very good catch, Slomo. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we wanted to just uh, do a few housekeeping uh, uh, details here just to make sure that uh, everyone is uh, modeling correctly. And uh, would like to just note that um, you should take a look at the fourth quarter bonus accrual, which should be, as we had said, uh, sort of on average of the three quarters uh, now that we've made a heavier accrual in the third quarter. So uh, 26 million, 25 million, something like that would be helpful. Please also note that we've increased our dividend. Um, sometimes that's not always picked up. And uh, we are going to uh, do some work on our accounts receivable. And I think with that, we've pretty much taken care of everything on the housekeeping front. Well, thank you all for joining us today. In closing, I want to reiterate how pleased I am with our third quarter performance. Uh, we accelerated the top line to double-digit growth with strong momentum as we move into the end of the fiscal year. 
And we remain confident in our ability to drive sustainable growth through focused expense management and continued investment in our people, product, and technology. With over 40 years of continuous growth, Vaxit has a proven history of navigating volatile markets successfully. We look forward to speaking with you again next quarter. In the meantime, please call Kendra Brown with additional questions. Operator, this ends today's call. Ladies and gentlemen, that's our conference for today. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.